Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I, I know we should talk about movies. This is a movie podcast, but I don't think that I can I can open the show knowing what I know about what has happened at your family uh, in your family this week. Of course, we have to talk about your son's birthday cake. <laughs> oh yeah, what that the, was a, that was a beaut. <laughs> what the hell was that? I wanted to bathe in it. <laughs> well, you know he. He really loves powdered donuts, and so he really wanted. <laughs> he didn't want cake. He wanted a donut cake. 
And so <laughs> it's like, so I'm like, I can't tell if this is really white trash or if this is just simply what? genius. <laughs> you can. So you... we picked a whole bunch of donuts. Oh my god! <laughs> and we basically made it like a little donut pyramid for him with with the little. Uh, munchkins all around it and everything and then people just got to you passed it around and people just took a donut off that they wanted it was actually really really fun and easy Uh, well it's perfect i mean yeah for for those for parents who have who have uh actually you know done birthdays yeah i mean it was it's the perfect cake it's a pile of donuts (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's just gonna get better but his smile is so great and the donut is such a great variety i mean you've got you definitely have donut holes uh-huh. clearly some filled donuts do i see a crawler in there there's a couple of we have french oh, crawlers we've got uh goodness. chocolate we've got sprinkles uh yeah a whole gamut would you of donuts. would you post that picture to instagram so i can link it <laughs> people have to see this like people who aren't your friends on facebook they have to see this please <laughs> I will. I thought right. for some reason I thought I did or somebody, but I looked. I, didn't. I looked for it. Believe me, I was. I've already <laughs> been hunting it down. It's. It is a brilliant thing. Thing of clear, sheer beauty. Yes, deliciousness. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. All right. We, we. Your your entire uh, house is under lockdown. I assume that all you've been doing is watching Stranger Things. <laughs> you know, one would think. <laughs> <laughs> But when everybody is uh, is sick in one way or another, it's like all I could do is you know, steal ten minutes here or there and then yeah. run around and do some other little thing that has to get done. So I I'm so close. I'm so close. <laughs> I can see the finish line. You know, I haven't even. I I'm still only one episode in, and I'll tell you why. Because Andy, the strain. Oh, the strain. Really? Season two of the strain hit Hulu, and I you know I watched all of season one in about seventy two hours, and then season two hit. And I've been walk, working my way through that. It's, I mean, you know, it's a vampire story, but it's also a disease story. And so I'm trying to keep in the theme of disease stuff. And I'm really, I'm really going all in on disease with the strain right now. So I'm, I'm very close to finishing. I'm only about two episodes shy of finishing season two. And then I have a whole year before season three hits Hulu. Is so. that, do you know if um, like season one was the first book and season two is the second book? I mean, has it been following the books in I, that pattern? I do not know. I know that Del Toro is a, is a producer on it. And so I, you know, my, my assumption has always been as somebody who's completely ignorant of the series of the book series comics, uh, is that it is, uh, books, books. Yeah. The, the graphic novels, right? They're not, not, no, they're it's not a book. novels. It's, it's a, a book. book. Yeah. Yeah, Del Toro co-wrote it with uh, really? some some See, feller. That goes to show the level of ignorance that I have. I I thought Clearly. it was a graphic novel. Super ignorant on this. Uh, I just I was know call you an ignoramus show. tonight, but uh. well, hey, at least we got it in under the under the intro. Get it in in the first five minutes. You, right, there you, you win a prize. Um, but Gold my assumption <laughs> my assumption has always been that it's much like The Walking Dead, where it's pretty close, and then it it slowly but surely over over episodes it diverges um so i don't know that's what i'm assuming that it's similar but not congruent how about that because i feel like i I never ended up reading after the first book although it's constantly been uh one of those things that i've been always meaning to pick up but um yeah i was wondering if um for some reason in my head i thought it was a trilogy of books um yeah it is based on the novel trilogy of the same name so um so yeah i keep meaning to pick up those other two it's just i've been Busy doing other things. Okay, there it is. I'm officially picking up the books. I got it. I really I enjoyed. To. I really enjoyed that first book. Did you really? I I am. I'm really enjoying the show. Insofar as the show is definitely a show on FX. You know what I mean? It's no Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, but it's quite good and uh, it, fun. I mean, it's quite a lot of fun. Let's say that it's quite a lot of fun. And you know, your mileage may vary. I feel like I don't want to watch the show until I finish the books. That's only probably, because I've started it, and it's just one of those things where it's like now I've got to finish the books before I can do it. So. That's that's probably smart. So yeah. here it is. Look look at that. There it is. The Night Eternal, the whole Strain trilogy on paperback, which of course I will not buy. There's the Kindle version right there. The Night Eternal, the trilogy. I can do that. The Strain trilogy, book three. Well, here you know, here's hoping. I'm excited about that. It's really gross. There's a lot of gross. 
Yeah, I mean, it's Del Toro. Yeah. <laughs> so, you yeah. Know, I'm not sure what else you're expecting, but... No, no, no. I like it. This is my kind of gross, though. I mean, it really is. Yeah. He All co-wrote right. it with Chuck Hogan, who wrote Prince of Thieves, yeah. which was adapted into the town. There it is. Totally different vibe. Very, very <laughs> totally different. Totally different vibe. I haven't read... I don't think I've read anything else by uh, Chuck Hogan. I should, I should add him to the list. The list of guys. Now I'm, I got to finish my Jack Reacher. I've only done about sixteen Jack Reacher books. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I got to finish Jack Reacher geez. out of seventy. There are seventy oh. hundred. You should do Born next. Niner. <laughs> oh, good <laughs> lord! I was able to draw the line with Ian Fleming Bond <laughs> books. There's no way I'm going to do any more of those. So, yeah. uh, okay, let's tell the people where we're from, Andy. Where are we from? <laughs> This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the film that imagines what Alfonso left behind when he took Sandra Bullock to space. That's right. It's his 2006 character comedy and disease classic, Children of Men. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, or join us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you've ever tried to pass customs with your sad Fuji face, then you're likely due to be sent right off to The Next Reel's Instagram, hashtag PonyPrize, hashtag GuessTheMovieChallenge. And with our sad Fuji faces on, let's infiltrate the camp of Fujis and find Games Master Steven Smart to find out who won this week. Hey guys! This week's movie was Stay Hungry from 1976, directed by Bob Raffleson and starring Jeff Bridges, Sally Field and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Congrats to At Fegfe who guessed it on Image One. You are entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks guys and see you later. We've got a blot spot. We got a little follow up on the blot spot, uh, and this one, uh, I'm going to call this one a win. Yeah, I think uh, I think that we might have seen this one coming. I love Serenity, and I actually watched it before ever seeing Firefly. It is an awesome film that basically checks all the boxes of things I look for in a movie. The acting is great, the script is brilliant, and the look of the film is superb. I struggle to find anything to complain about in this film. I'm curious, though, to know how you guys feel about the change they made to the way River is freed, according to Simon in the TV series, versus what we see in the film. Your rank six, my rank three. Uh, you know, I, I, we touched on that, uh, but we didn't touch on how we felt about it, I guess, uh, which is that, that there, it is different. The crossover is different. Which uh, I don't even actually remember what y- happened in the TV series. Y- yeah, and I'm really, I feel like I'm really operating at a deficit there, too, because my, we, after we watched the film together as a family, we did start watching, uh, we watched, we've already watched the first episode of Firefly, and we're going to work through all 14 but my memory of the rescue uh, is really uh, not, it's not that clear. I actually don't even think we watched the entire first episode. I think we watched through the battle and the first kind of robbery. So, um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a little unclear on that. I'm going to have to check in later. Yep. Uh, but, but I will tell you, I can tell you even having not seen it, that my feeling of it is that the rescue that occurred in the film has become canon. And I'm okay because it came last and because it was done so well, I'm okay letting that be the the rescue that is okay in my head. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And I don't think they, did they show the rescue in the show I don't, or was I it just, it, did Simon just talk about it? I don't, I don't recall. Well, I, do I recall. look forward, to, I look forward to revisiting this once we've both rewatched the series. Absolutely. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. I think you should go first. You do? Yes. Why do you why do I get the uh the luck of the draw? Because mine is uh I don't know. Mine is mine is more fun to talk about. <laughs> Yours is red band. Mine oh, yes. has no red band. Although I'm really excited about Mine. Uh, my film is Complete Unknown uh, from writer director Joshua Marston, uh, co written with Julian Shepard. This film stars uh, Rachel Weiss, Michael Shannon, Kathy Bates, Danny Glover, Danny Glover, Condola Rashad, Chris Lowell, Aaron Drake, and others. It is the story of a woman, Rachel Wise 
who changes identities every time she wants to move on from something sounds like difficult. And we pick up the story when uh, she encounters an old flame uh, at a, a birthday dinner party. And I, the trailer intrigues me in, at so many levels. This whole idea of what identity is and what it means, like what would it look like if I just one day walked out? And, you know, is it possible to really shake who you are based on kind of your trail of breadcrumbs? I think it's fascinating. Uh, and so I love seeing this on, on screen. I have only seen one of Joshua Marston's uh, other films, uh, and that was uh, the his earlier film. I think that was, uh, yeah, 2004, Maria's Full of Grace. Maria Full of Grace, uh, a.k.a. Yeah, she's full of something. Ooh. <laughs> That was a good movie, that Maria Full of Grace. I deeply enjoyed that film. I have not seen Forgiveness of Blood. Uh, That one looks really interesting. I didn't know a thing about it until looking at his credits for uh, for this film. So I'm I'm adding this one to my list as well. Although he did do an episode of The Newsroom that was great back in 2012. He's done a bunch of other uh, TV episodes. He did an episode of American Crime. Last year, we've talked a little bit about American Crime because our uh, our uh, buddy uh, JJ uh, was camera uh, cable camera on one of the episodes of American Crime. So, um, anyhow, I think this looks fantastic. I'm very curious about it. How did it hit you? I agree, and I I really liked Maria Full of Grace. Also, this was a really interesting uh, an interesting trailer that. Um, I, to me, it looks like it's going to have some really interesting characters and some character dynamics as we explore this uh, interesting person that uh, Rachel Vice has kind of become as she basically decides to rewrite herself as as she deems necessary, and how Michael Shannon, who always is great, um, uh, kind of comes up against that when they uh, reconnect. And uh, I, it really piqued my curiosity. I, uh, it looks very um, like there's a lot of uh, mystery and drama in it. And uh, definitely, uh, it's, it's one that I feel I'd want to uh, check out. Probably via rental, since I can't imagine it's going to be much of a wide release. I know. God, you're such a pessimist. No, I'm just I'm just realistically <laughs> looking forward to when I'll get to see it. <laughs> I am too. It hits the U.S. It's been playing uh, worldwide across uh, festivals, and I say worldwide generously. That that includes the United States and the Czech Republic. So you have likely not seen this film. It hits USA in air quotes wide release. August 26th, 2016, and Greece, September 22nd, 2016. So, you know, maybe don't mark your calendar quite yet for this film, but keep uh, keep a weather eye for digital information. I'm hoping that it hits iTunes quick because I'm excited to see it, and I hope it is. it finds its own success. There you go. Excellent, excellent. All right, your turn. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to see mine, and perhaps it's because... I feel like now's the time to watch this before my daughter gets any older. <laughs> this is going to be a good a good lesson film for me. What do I need to start watching out for as she ages? Uh, this is the movie The Edge of Seventeen, the comedy drama written and directed by Kelly Freeman and uh, starring the uh, wonderful Haley Steinfeld and Woody Harrelson and Kira Sedgwick, uh, all people I love, along with a host of other people. I am, uh, the the comedy in this is just really funny as this awkward girl is trying to find her place in school and life. Uh, you know, her brother is kind of a, a hot jock and her best friend starts seeing her brother and, and you know, she's got this fantastic teacher in Woody Harrelson who clearly they have this, this great love-hate relationship. Um, I, everything about the trailer is just, it just hits all uh, the right places for me. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're vulgar. They, the comedy in it is really biting and funny and dark and it feels like reality. And I think that's why all of it works so well for me. Um, I never saw what Kelly had written before. I believe it was post-grad with, um, Alexis, uh, Bledel. Alexis Bledel, yeah. I, I never saw that she had written that, um, and I think that might be all I know of from her. 
So um, I'm curious to see this because I think it looks like it's done by somebody with a really assured hand. What do you think of this one? Oh, are you kidding? Yeah, no. It, <laughs> uh, first of all, I loved it. Uh, I posted the trailer that's posted on the site is the Red Band trailer. So, you know, if you yeah, have... So be forewarned. Uh, yeah, be forewarned. It is, it is a little bit uh, on the adult edge of things. But it is, you, you know, it clearly is is channeling the the darkness of the the period uh with humor and i like that approach i think that i struggle because my daughter's a little bit older than yours and so when i watch this trailer i laugh and then immediately throw up uh <laughs> and so i you know i'm actually uh I, i'm excited to to see it i again i will also probably uh, rent this one um uh because i can't imagine this is going to be one of those films that i take the kids to so Nope, uh, but I, I think it looks hysterical. <laughs> her her friend, uh, played by Haley Lou Richardson, is is a very funny uh, young actress, and and uh, so I'm I'm very excited to see them on screen together. Excellent. Well, this film uh, was scheduled for release September 30th, but it was just recently selected as the closing night gala for the Toronto International Film Festival, which is playing in September. So now they have actually opted to push this to November 18th release. And James L. Brooks, who is uh, one of the producers, um, I, I guess, you know, he's one of those guys who mentors these young up and coming filmmakers and and uh, yeah, so uh, with Kelly Freeman Craig, he's kind of given her a little push and they are pushing this into right into the big holiday corridor, as they say uh, in Variety, um, to take full advantage of the holiday corridor and to capitalize on what we expect will be very strong word of mouth as the film screens this fall. I'm all for it. Uh, yes, indeed. There you go. All right. There you go. So, it's the first baby in 18 years, Andy. You can't call it Froly. I can't really remember when I last had any hope. And I certainly can't remember when anyone else did either. Because really, since women stopped being able to have babies, what's left to hope for? The world was stunned today by the death of Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet, the youngest person on Earth, was 18 years, 4 months, 20 days, 16 hours, and 8 minutes old. The ultimate mystery, why are women infertile? Some say it's genetic experiments, pollution. Why do you think we can't make babies anymore? Doesn't matter. It's all over in 50 years. It's too late. Move along! Move along! Andy, we're doing Children of Men. Yes, we are. Let me just tell you. I turned on this movie. I did not remember uh, that it was that there was a disease involved. Uh, I did not remember that uh, it was. I didn't really remember the period of the film. Uh, I think it's safe to say I didn't remember the premise. Uh, <laughs> so I did remember the birth, and I and I remembered the stunning one of the stunning very long shots. Apart from that, I think it is safe to say that this is effectively a first time viewing for me. Okay. So that I mean that's that just sort of sets the stage because I I have said over the last several weeks that I remembered it and didn't like it. And I I I watched it again and now I realize I didn't remember enough of it to actually make a judgment on. I I don't know what mood I was in when I saw it when it came out. Uh but it it was not uh, clearly not a good one. And so <laughs> So, so here I am uh, watching the 2006 British-American science fiction thriller Children of Men, written and directed uh, by, uh, co-written by Alfonso Cuaron, directed by Cuaron, uh, based on P.D. James' 1992 novel. Uh, P.D. James, you know, she's a right honorable Baroness James of Holland Park. Did you know that? I did. That's a great title. Isn't it? Andy, it got me thinking that perhaps we have been underselling uh, ourselves and members of the Next Real community and that we need to institute more official titles. Who gets to uh, dub them? I don't, I don't know any of the mechanics <laughs> yet, but I know that Right Honorable will be involved. Uh, I, I think we can, we can move through Baron and Baroness into something with a, even a, a little bit more... Um, pomp and circumstance but just know that i'm thinking about it and that a title is coming your way there will probably be a ceremony 
I, I do feel that the United States is sorely lacking in titles in general. Sorely, <laughs> sorely lacking. Uh, anyhow, so the, it, based on the book that I have not read, uh, clearly have not read the book, <laughs> Children of Men <laughs> by P.D. James. Uh, and I have to say it hit me better this time around. There you go. What do you think of this movie? Uh, well, I have to say a wrong has been righted because the fact that you went on and on so many years, how much you just thought this movie was terrible and you hated it. Finally. Oh, I did. And you know, what? no, you know how this works. It becomes a point of pride. Like you're the guy who doesn't like children of men. You don't have any, I have no reason to do that. It just is. I didn't like the movie out of habit. I, I right. really that is the extent of it. And I have been tested and I am fully scorned and, and shamed. <laughs> Believe me. Uh I'm I apologize. I, I will tell you, this is it's not my favorite film of all time. It's not in my top ten, but it certainly deserved a significant re ranking uh from in my flick chart. Which <laughs> I good. I think I think may have, have gone up against uh um, you know, what's his name and what's his name at White Castle uh, and Lost. Rolling <laughs> Tumor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, that is a that, pretty funny movie. That is... <laughs> okay, that's true. Uh, oh, okay, man. so anyhow, your, your point. Well, I, I love this film. Um, I remember watching this uh, in the theater when it came out and just being blown away by uh, this amazing story that Quaron kind of unfolded and presented to us. I mean, it's definitely bleak. It uh, is full of despair and uh, hopelessness as this is a world that's basically crumbling and falling apart because there are no more children. The disease in this film is basically unnamed. Nobody really knows what it is, but basically all of the, I believe in the film, it's all the women all of a sudden basically went sterile and no one could have a baby anymore. And so we join the world in 2027. The last baby had been born, I believe, in 2009. And there's just no, uh, you know, there's no more schools. There's no more, uh, you know, children laughing. And because of that, everybody who's there uh, left on the earth really kind of feels this sense of hopelessness because what is there to live for? They're just going to basically live and then eventually die and that will be the end of the human race. And so it, the film is just full of this kind of just this overwhelming sorrow and just depression of these people just kind of trucking on um, just out of habit almost. And so I, I really liked this uh, this story and the fact that it ended up becoming this story of hope as all of a sudden there is this uh, this woman who ends up you know pregnant, and these people now our hero Theo, who's kind of um, stumbled into this whole thing, now has to kind of become her savior and help uh, get her to the right people and help her deliver the baby. I just thought it was just a, just a stunningly beautiful film. I, I really connected with it. I always have. I've uh, every time I watch it, I just love it all the more. And, you know, this to me is uh, um, a really good example of Quaron kind of at his best. I mean, this is a filmmaker who knows how to uh, put really strong stories together in really interesting ways. I really agree with that. And um, it, it is a terrific film. It throws me for a complete loop. And I, I want your take on the overall, uh, the hope arc, I'm going to call it. It's the arc of hope. Uh, and that is the film, as you say, it starts, it, it's really grim. And everybody has clearly become uh, acclimated or adjusted to this, uh, the, the world they're living in. Where and, and they show us not just that London has fallen, that the UK has fallen, but that the rest of the world, that the UK is actually in a pretty good state compared to the rest of the world, which is which is completely gone to pieces, right? So we feel like they're they're, they're the sort of last holdout of uh, of sort of you know society and civility, even though it's not great, um, and so it, it's grim. Then the arc of hope starts to move upward as we discover that there is, in fact, uh, there is an 
agency of change in place that people are starting to trust. We discover that there is this woman who is pregnant, that there is, in fact, a baby. There's this new life. New life is this the symbol of goodness, the symbol of hope, in fact, and that the journey of the film is to take carry this little bundle of hope and free it from all of this nastiness and get it to this, this body uh, politic that supposedly will know what to do with it. I do, I'm not quite clear on that, uh, you know, what the, the point is of that. And then the film ends, uh, and um, the arc of hope for me ends up sinking in <laughs> in the ocean as you realize that they have just, that, that our hero has died or, or is unclear, but he's not looking great, and that this baby has just been released on the sea into uh, a world that has fallen completely bananas. And and it's sort of crushing. It's sort of soul-sucking and crushing. I, I can see where you're getting that. I mean, certainly it's a dark ending because our hero does die. But I feel like the story has given us the hope that at least we need. I mean, I didn't feel like we needed any more exposition or any more explanation there. We see this boat arriving. Okay, seriously, the- what <laughs> you've got to at least acknowledge what is going on. <laughs> that is yes. you are being this is children of men at your house right exactly there is a monsoon uh thundering down <laughs> upon me right now <laughs> it is one for the record book so you know yes it you, is you at least have to acknowledge the explosions <laughs> right <laughs> no it's like uh what is it boogie nights i've got a <laughs> you know there's there's a guy in the back of the room here who's just throwing a his <laughs> snap crackers on the floor periodically throughout <laughs> The show tonight, just to you know, create a mood. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure it's safe to podcast. I think there is a minimum standard of health and safety we have to acknowledge. Okay, go ahead. So anyway, yes, the um, uh, the boat is arriving. The tomorrow is the name of the boat. Very um, kind of fitting name and hopeful. Um, and hopeful, and it's it's the human project who is supposedly on it, and this is a team of scientists who are kind of working to figure out what's going on and hopefully save humanity. And and that's I, why I they think, need her, right, as a biological specimen of the she, fertility. Right, she is the the, the first person in eighteen plus years who has actually um, had a baby, and so they're getting her to the uh, the human project so that they can finally see if they can figure out how to uh, how to solve this um this disease, how to cure this disease so people can start having babies again and um and, and for me i felt like the story ended on a very positive note because the boat arrives she sees it they see her and uh, c- kind of coming out of the fog, and yes, our hero dies, but the fact is that he has he has succeeded in his mission, and he has connected the two. And yes, while it is personally a very tragic story for him, I think that he has delivered uh, one of hope for humanity as a whole. Well, I agree with that, and he was also the, a character of great transformation, right? I mean, he was Absolutely. sort of—he was the guy who uh, who ha- was acclimated to society, to living the way that they were living. He had a—he had a job that he hated, but w- was doing it, and um, he had overcome, or, or was in the middle of sort of grieving over his, you know, his wife and lost child, and all of these things were not going very well, but he was numb to, it, it felt like very numb to the world, and this reinvigorated him. It gave him something to live for, something to work for, something to strive for, and that was, uh, and, and Clive Owen was, I, I think, terrific embodying this, uh, uh, you know, this this particular character. I think he was incredibly strong at delivering that that level of, of sadness and grief, uh, which, which I think is hard to play. And do so in a way that is ultimately a film that is is peppered with some incredibly complex action sequences. To me, it was really um, an Oscar caliber performance that he delivered here. I mean, it, he was so good, and so and, and his transformation. I mean, he's he starts out as just kind of a drunk non-believer. I mean, he, his uh, as as Jasper, his friend Michael Caine, had said at one point in the film. Um, you know, he had lost or his faith lost out to chance when when uh, his son or his son died. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he had with Julian. And so he was kind of at this place where it's like, why? Why go on if life is going to just 
make its own choices up and, and why bother trying anymore? And so he had kind of, I mean, he was always drinking. He had kind of thrown in the towel and he was just kind of moving through life. It was only this, and even when he offered to help, uh, it was really only because it was Julian. That's really the only reason that he offered to help, that it was his, his ex that, uh, that kind of brought him in. And even then, it was for money. I mean, he, had no, he really just didn't care at all. It wasn't until he saw Key's belly and uh, realized that she is pregnant and this is huge. And that's the first kind of glimmer of hope that he starts to have. And then watching him as he goes from this despondent, disinterested uh, person to somebody who um, becomes a protector and becomes... Uh, a knight. The, a knight, right. He is the, the one protector um, who is going to do everything he can to make sure that she's okay. And I mean, it's it's a just a beautiful transformation. And obviously, uh, you know, like we've already said, it becomes one of self sacrifice. Even as we get mm-hmm. to the end, one of the, the I I love that the moment in the barn when he does see the that she is pregnant. Uh, first of all, she is in it just incredibly. It's an incredibly powerful reveal, and uh, you know, Claire Hope uh, Ashty uh, is just a delightful young actress that uh, I think did a, a fantastic job in this in this film but his pivot in that point at in the barn pays off so beautifully when they get separated later and he continues to charge on again in this sort of the gestalt of the knight of the savior uh even as he's lost her and it 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 seems like such a an earned move for him to dive into the fray alone uh even coming as far as he has emotionally in the film it was just great yeah, absolutely. Um, the screen, here's the thing I'm I'm curious about. Uh, they changed the fertility problem from uh, from male infertility in the book to female infertility in the film. What's your? Did you find anything on that, or what's your hunch as to why that that was switched? You know, I I didn't really find much about that, except that I know that some people who were um, very much fans of P.D. James' book and the religious aspects that the book had um, felt like that was a, a just kind of a typical Hollywood PC sort of uh, change. That it was uh, the woman and the fact that the um, that uh, it wasn't Julian who was pregnant, but it was uh, it was this this immigrant Key who was pregnant. Um, there were a lot of changes that people felt they uh, they were trying to tone down the religiousness of it. So um, so I don't know. I mean, I I don't in my head. I don't really. I guess I, I don't see a huge difference in the men being infertile versus the women being infertile. Um, the in in fact, in my head, it seems a little more. Uh, I don't know. Virgin Mary sort of thing. I mean, I know Key says she's not a virgin, but the fact that she was, you know, women were sterile and here she is all of a sudden the person who becomes pregnant, it almost seems a little more religious to me because it's almost like, in a way, it's like a virgin birth. You exactly. Know? And they actually nod to that in the script, right? She says, uh, he says, do you know who the father is? She says, well, I'm a virgin. Right. And then they <laughs> laugh and they toss it off because that right. would be too much. But I love that as a nod, sort of a sardonic nod to to what everybody's thinking. Right. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I guess if, so uh, probably my my sense is that uh, it is less visually interesting if it's miraculously one man who is suddenly fertile, right? It, it, yeah. It's easy to, in the book, to kind of tell a story. You can keep all these details and all that. You can imagine sort of what's going on. But on screen, there is something enormously powerful about magic fertility and the, uh, you know, the, the image of a pregnant woman. And I think it's just much stronger than <laughs> had Clive Owen taken his robe off in the barn and covered himself like <laughs> and said, "Look, I'm fertile." Like nobody, nobody gets it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, like, I mean, it still is the reveal of the pregnant woman. 
It's not like we have to reveal that he's he's fertile, but uh, it, but it is interesting though because but in then the you book, could end up with like you know there could be any number of women pregnant. It's it's not very exciting when when there's like oh he's fertile. Okay, well get to work, man. Like we need yeah, to right. start a system, and it's not a story anymore. <laughs> it's incredibly powerful when there's one special woman who is who suddenly has the power of fertility. It's it is not visually interesting if it's oh, this guy is it's just a sex comedy. <laughs> that's you know right children yes. of women it's it's really <laughs> dumb that is a dumb movie <laughs> oh but it is interesting that that in the book julian is the one who gets pregnant and luke um is the one who impregnates her and he's the one who all of a sudden isn't uh isn't sterile anymore and that he was a former priest mm. So uh, again, it makes me uh, think that maybe there was something that they were trying to pull yeah. pull that tone out of a little out of it a little bit, right? Because um, it does feel a little more um, politically charged, I think, in the film than at least how I've read about the book. The book seems like it kind of focuses a little bit. I mean, it's a balance, I guess, between the religious side and also some of the politics, but it definitely has a little more of a religious uh, overtone. In an interview with uh, Quaron and uh, Inri Tu and uh, Guillermo del Toro, did a a uh, sit down with uh, Charlie Rose. And in this interview, Quaron says Pan's Labyrinth, Babel, and Children of Men are sister films, he says thematically. And then he says, we like to stick our forks in each other's salads. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to step back from the last quote, which is may, may not be relevant and weird. And ask you, what do you think of that comparison between these three films? I think it's interesting. Um, I I guess I hadn't really thought about that too much. I'd actually, I'd really have to kind of look at them each a little bit more. I know the three of them are kind of like all buddy buddy, and you know, kind of produce each other's things, and they all really help each other out. And I mean, really, it's it's an amazing trio of filmmakers, aren't they? Truly, truly, it's just just it's really stunning. Um, but um, they're. There definitely is uh, a lot of interesting character journeys in each of those films. So, I, I mean, I really could see that. I just would need to look at Babel and Pan's Labyrinth again really closely it, after hearing that quote to see how they kind of fit as sister films. If I recall, you weren't as much of a fan of Babel. No, or, I mean, I like, like a few so of the stories in yeah. it. I mean, I like it. I just I didn't think it uh, was worthy of all the praise that yeah. I got. yeah. Uh, well, I thought that was really interesting and particularly interesting that he said it, that it wasn't a critic that made that comparison, that it was actually the filmmaker that made. Uh, I liked that a lot. Uh, yeah. We've talked a little bit about the transition from uh, book to to script, but just in terms of the execution of this script by Quaron and Timothy J. Sexton and David Arada and Mark Fergus and Hawk Ospie and a little bit of uh, uh, peppered by Clive Owen. Uh, and I, and other people who didn't make it onto the a lot list. of hands, a <laughs> lot of hands and fingers in this script, but it yes. doesn't feel messy to me. No, it doesn't. But this is a film that uh, I mean, it's the production uh, began. I, I'm not exactly sure when um, the original producers first brought on uh, a screenwriter to actually adapt it. But the first person who adapted it was Paul Chart, who isn't credited anymore. His script was rewritten by Mark Fergus and Hawk Ostby, both of whom were credited. Um, they um, brought Quaron on in 2001 um, after Itumama Tambien, um, along with him and Timothy J. Sexton, and they began rewriting it at that point. Um, Quaron said he wouldn't read it. He read a condensed version. Uh, he had Timothy uh, read it, and then the two of them wrote the script, but Quaron didn't want to start second guessing himself based on the book, which I thought was an interesting way to go. And then he uh, stepped away from the project for a little bit to go do Azkaban. Um, and uh, at that point, that's when David Arada came on board to do his rewrite. A lot of these, it's amazing how many hands ended up uh, on this. And then, um, and that because of that rewrite, that's what uh, got Clive Owen actually to get attached, and from that point, once uh, uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban um, was out and the world was happy with a great Harry Potter film, um, that's when Coron finally came on to really get this thing jump started. I found it so interesting that uh, so many of the writers actually ended up still being credited. I feel like so often a lot of screenwriters work on a script and. 
uh, somebody else comes in to rewrite it and then somebody else comes in to rewrite it and then more people come in to rewrite it. And it seems like, I, I don't know, the WGA is weird. So often it seems like they give it to the last person or maybe like the last two people or the first person or the last person. This is such a weird case where you've got the uh, the final pair of Alfonso and Timothy. You've got David Arada and his bit. And then you have Mark Fergus and Hawk coming on to do uh, one of the early rewrites. It's interesting that they all ended up getting credited and of course, the the original screenwriter didn't. So, I have no idea how that wacky writers guild works. That's it, it is crazy how that I just, how that happens. I do remember when it was nominated for best uh, best adapted screenplay. Uh, it it seemed like there was almost a a chuckle in the room when they <laughs> read all of the people who worked on it because it seemed you know most of the time it's like one writer, one writer, maybe two, and here we've got you know five of them. It's it's as big as the production, you know, when they they announced Best Picture and like fifty people stand up, right? Exactly, um, all those producers and and uh, associate producers, and this guy got a producer credit because he was so and so's assistant. And yeah, <laughs> crazy. Well, so it's a great film. It it is. Uh, it, it really is a great film, and it tells a, a very powerful story. And it, in so many ways, it's a film of our time, right? I mean, when you look at at just like. Um, the the state of public discourse uh, in the United States, in particular, it's uh, it, it we're in an era of dirty pool, and I think this film really sets out a future in which, you know, it it's this is one possible horizon. You know, this is what it looks like when things fall apart and we don't know how to talk to each other. And so I think it's a really it, it's a movie of the day, and I, I like that message in particular. And I like that. Um, that he worked to kind of create this future that didn't feel like some crazy future. It actually felt like today plus a few years. Yes. You know, just it, it didn't feel like they had to um, futurize it. It just felt like they had to look at, okay, how much of like, uh, what is it? It's 2016 when this was made, 2008. S- yeah, six. Six. Uh, and that, so it's, it's looking forward 20 years. So look backward 20 years. How much has changed in those 20 years? Not that Not much. Not that much. Really, right. the, so, it, when you think about about what is going on in the intervening 20 years in this film, they made some really smart choices to not futurize it too much, right? It, it, it's really smartly degraded, in fact, as systems begin to break down. There are some fun, you know, screens tend to be everywhere and used well. Um, but overall, it's it's generally degraded more than evolved. And uh, yeah, and I think cars might be the only thing that really <laughs> reflects a continuation of uh, redesign, right? Yeah, right? I mean, we still have new car models. But the the fact that the we industry. even have new car models, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, that one of those things like, like you can sort of feel like systems that have stalled. Like it, we, there, by no rights should we be driving the same kind of cars if you look at Absolutely. traditional, you know. Yeah, futurist films yeah right. you, you know so anyhow um they didn't minority report it you know which i right. i like very much but what i was going to say is that the the thing that you the, the next thing that you hear about this film in particular is a celebration of the incredible long shot work and the technology that he built and put into place to achieve this vision with really long sequences how many how many big shots did he do like that? Do you have a do you have a number? I don't have the number of shots, but what I did is somebody actually compiled every shot in the film that was 45 seconds or longer and it is 31 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> there are 31 minutes worth of shots that uh, are 45 seconds or longer and 3 of those shots are over 90 seconds. In fact, the longest 3 are 3 minutes and 19 seconds, which is the birth four minutes and seven seconds, which is the car sequence, and six minutes and 18 seconds, which is the uh, the final build, building sequence as, as Theo uh, tries to get into the building and find key. It, it's just unreal. And, it really is. And, you know, and I know we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but the, the fact that it was shot intentionally all natural light, uh, even the night shots were shot with natural light using lit by fires. Uh, there, there were no electric lights used to light this film uh, artificially. I didn't hear that. That's the truth. That came directly out of Emmanuel Lubezki's mouth that to is my awesome. face wow. by way of computers. <laughs> by way of, by way of uh, YouTube. A tube that was you. 
uh, <laughs> which which is bananas uh, when you think about the complexity of the film. Now, the, keeping the the lighting uh, deceptively simple uh, does not, in fact, talk to uh, about at all about the technology that they actually used to to shoot it and the rigs that they had to build to capture some of these long sequences. And I found it really funny. I listened to some interviews back and forth between Lubeski and and um, uh, um, Quaron and. It is delightful to hear neither of them take 100% credit for the idea to shoot these incredibly compact, long long sequences. Cuaron says, oh, no, this was totally Lubeski's idea. And Lubeski says, no, 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 this was totally Cuaron's idea. He had a vision, and I just said, man, that's going to be hard, but we can do that. And so both of them going back and forth, not taking credit for how hard each other made the film. To that actually is create. hilarious. It is hilarious. I can hear in your reaction the level of hilarity uh it is they're yeah. they're wacky guys they're wacky guys <laughs> it's interesting Quaron had been really kind of doing this sort of stuff through his films that we had seen in the past now i really can't remember long shots in the films before this one but i think to a certain extent that speaks to how well he does it and how how well integrated into the story they are. The fact that there are 31 minutes worth of uh, long shots in this uh, really surprised me when I learned that. And I think if I went back to A Little Princess or Great Expectations, E2 Mama Tom Bien, Harry Potter, any of those films, I would probably find great examples of other long shots that he had done in his previous features and uh, and go, oh, there it is. And look how brilliantly he did it there. Obviously here, he does some extra work to make those particularly three long ones really, really magical. But just the fact that he, he continues to hold them so long and so well, I think speaks to uh, just his level of confidence as a director. And also I think the way he chooses to tell his stories, which become very, uh, it, it ends up having this interesting... Um, sense of presence that I really enjoy. And we certainly saw that in Gravity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you mentioned you to Mom and Tom. Yeah, and I, I actually don't remember the the long shots in that film either, but it was one that was particularly mentioned by him in an interview with John August, uh, who they sat down to talk specifically about the power of these long shots in script writing, you know, how you actually craft the screenplay to take advantage of and to to kind of illuminate these long sequences and how powerful it can be. And he said something really interesting. And this is, I think I have to give credit to John August here interpreting something that Quaron said. I, I'm I'm not it's not entirely clear in the interview if if these are Quaron's words. So but but it's really stuck with me. Cutting is a powerful tool, but it has a great cost too. Uh, I that hit me right between the eyes because I am somebody when I'm cutting my own projects I cut a lot uh, and I tend to cut much more frenetically probably than I should and uh, putting some more thought into what uh, you know the the story that each sequence is trying to tell maybe I could get away with cutting less and telling more Um, and I, I think that's one of the sort of key lessons of Quaron's filmmaking. It's uh, it actually is really um, smart to look at it that way. I think there's a really interesting light because so often I have heard um, filmmakers or storytellers talking about editing and how difficult it is to do these long takes because everything has to be right and it can really slow things down and it can really make things uh, drag and it, because you're stuck with it. And I think in order to do it, you really have to be on your toes and you have to, you know, all things have to hit just right, which is why it's so hard. We'll talk a little bit more about how hard it really is with some of them um, a little bit later. But I, I, I think it's really interesting because he's right. There is a definite cost with cutting as well. I mean, look at some of the overcutting that we've seen in some films and how detrimental it can really be to storytelling and how hard it can be or how hard it can make to watch a film. And here, he's finding a way to do it without cutting and using his tools to actually move the camera or move things within the frame to um, to tell the story in as effective a way as he could do uh, if he was actually cutting. It's pretty genius. And it, obviously, he's rubbed off on in Yara too as well. I mean, look oh, at sure. The Revenant. Look yeah. at, you know, uh, Birdman. Birdman. Geez. You know, it, it's interesting, too, how much more powerful these long sequences are in this film than even in Gravity. 
uh, which was gorgeous. But because you know so much of it is an effect, uh, there's so much like created on screen uh, around you. For some reason, for me, my mind can't believe the trick, even though I know there is some fantastic camera wizardry going on in Gravity to create what they created. I, I know it. I've seen the behind the scenes. I get it. For some reason, these are these films or these sequences in Children of Men are made so much more powerful because of that level of intimacy and realism that I get of uh, being in the car, of being in the room during the birth, of 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 not cutting. It makes me feel like I'm really there, and I well, you, I can't ever feel like I'm really there in Gravity until she lands face down in the dirt. Yeah, then believe me, space. I've I've landed face down in the dirt. I was there, <laughs> but yeah. Right, right. No, it's it's brilliant. I, I enjoy Quaron's storytelling. And not just, I mean, obviously, we're talking a lot about how he puts these shots together. But I think it's a lot more than that. It's how yes. he uh, how he works with the actors. I think he's just a really solid filmmaker and knows how to uh, knows how to create these journeys um, in really compelling ways. Let's talk first shot, last shot. Yes, this is a really fantastic example of first shot, last shot, because I think this is really the first time that we've really strongly been able to tie audio into the first shot, last shot. There's so much more to the first shot, last shot here than what we actually see. Really, it's the audio. That's the first thing we hear and because it's over black both times. Um, the film starts and we hear news reports over black, introducing us to this world and the whole idea of baby Diego and how we're kind of in this hopeless situation of no more babies and all this before we cut to um, our first shot, which is a crowded coffee shop. Everyone is riveted to the TV um, behind camera as they watch this news about Diego's death. And we see our protagonist, Theo, come in, get a coffee and leave. Um, And I should say there is a cut to the TV as we kind of get a sense of baby Diego and everything going on here. But then we cut back to the the single shot. And this is one of our long shots. If it weren't for that cutaway to the TV, it would be a solid shot because we then follow Theo all the way out of the coffee shop. We're introduced to this future London that is just run down and and horrible looking as we look at Fleet Street and see kind of what it looks like. We follow him down the street a ways as he stops to get a paper. We kind of go around him. We look back at the coffee shop where he was and an explosion rips through the building and knocks people off their feet blows the windows out of all the vehicles passing by. And then through the smoke, we see a woman walking out carrying her arm. That's the first shot of this film, setting up in a really powerful way what this world is like. Um, But like I said, it starts with the audio, setting the world up with the news. The last shot is we see this through the fog. We see the boat, the tomorrow, coming through the fog toward Key in her boat. Theo is kind of hunched over presumably dead. Key has her baby, and we see the tomorrow coming toward her as the buoy uh, blinks nearby. It cuts to black, and over the black, we then hear children laughing and playing. I think that it is, for me, even more powerful when you just get rid of the opening and closing visual sequences and just compare audio reports of death and destruction and children laughing and playing. Um, yeah. That that tells for me the entire story uh, through sound, and I, you know, as someone who spends his days and nights thinking in terms of what goes in people's ears, uh, I really appreciate that. I 100 percent agree. I mean, the visual I think definitely works. You know, you see this this kind of destruction of this this future time, and then we have that moment of hope as we have that single person sitting there in the sea waiting for this rescue boat to come. That works really well. But speaking, going back to Quaron and this amazingly visual director, I think it's really fascinating that audio over black is what introduces us to this film and what uh, we sign off with. Yeah, truly agree. You it, would do you think uh, you're Quaron? Okay, you wake up tomorrow morning and it's 2005, and you're shooting this film, and you're Quaron, and you're first of all, you're like, whoa. This is awesome. I'm Alfonso Cuaron. And then you have to go shoot this opening sequence, or you have to go cut the opening sequence, right? You're going to go sit down in the edit bay, and you're going to you're going to work with the ed- your editor, and you're going to cut the sequence. Would you have cut to the TV, or would you have found another way to keep this one long shot? I don't know. I was really debating about that in my head. Uh, did they try to do this without cutting to the TV for a while? My hunch was it... it 
the TV helps the audience click with the story a little bit more because we are getting, I think when we're just seeing the people looking at this story, we we tend to start focusing on Clive Owen. And yes, we're hearing the news, but we're not fully absorbing everything about the importance of it. Um, and so when he leaves and, and everything, I think that we don't walk out of that coffee shop with quite the level of despair uh, that we would have otherwise if we didn't cut to it. So in retrospect, if I were Quaron and I knew um, that I would be cutting into it, I probably would have just swung the camera around to the screen and then swung back to them before following them out so I could have kept that one shot. I think so too. That was exactly going to be my answer and it's not because it's not because of anything you said. It's all because of my ego. If I was Alfonso <laughs> Cuarón, I would have wanted that long shot. I would not wanted to have a podcast 10 years later with these two idiots <laughs> talking about how <laughs> he cut away to the damn TV. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's my take. Uh it, it's a beautiful Very pairing and, and probably one of the best first shot, last shot pairings we've talked about yet. Uh just great. We've already talked about Clive Owen as Theo Faron. Uh what else would you like to say about Clive before we jump into the others? That was a very uh uh Quaron esque way of saying his last name. Faron Faron, Faron. Theo Faron. Quaron and Faron. <laughs> I believe they call him Farron. <laughs> they the do. Film, but... <laughs> they do, but I was so excited imagining you as Alfonso <laughs> Quaron. That's all I had in my head. <laughs> oh, so funny. Yeah, that's a good catch. Uh, Clive Owen, man, I just, I watched this and all I could think of is, where are my great Clive Owen movies today? Why is he not in like half the movies that I go see? Because I just love watching Clive Owen on screen. He's just riveting. He's just a brilliant actor and he just doesn't get enough. Oh, and it yes. frustrates me. Oh, goodness, me too. I mean, from... Uh, Inside Man, oh, he was so good in that film. He's got a couple coming up that are in uh, that are filming or in post production, pre production for 2016 17. I am not currently watching The Nick, and I have heard that this is the thing we should be watching if we want to get great Clive Owen, that he is just fantastic as Dr. John Thackeray on this series. So, I don't want to say that that he's not doing great work like he was back then, because right. I think this is probably uh, something that that he chalks up to some of his best work in his career. That's what I have heard. Well, I need to check that one out. Yeah, he is going to be in Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, and I'm really wondering about that film if it's going to because this is Luc Besson's next huge budget uh, sci-fi. <laughs> you see who else thing. is in it though. Uh, yeah, everybody. Ethan Hawke, Andy. Ethan Hawke, John Goodman, Dane DeHane, Rihanna, Car- Cara Rutger Delevingne. Hauer. Yeah. It's insane. Oh, yeah. Herbie Hancock. It's... <laughs> Herbie Hancock. Have you seen the uh, the the robot designs? They are so Luc Besson. Oh, my God. The whole thing is so crazy, Luc Besson. It is so I really, crazy. I just don't know what to say about this film. I, I hope I like it, but I also... Hoped that I would like Fifth Element. Everything about that looked great in the trailers. This one looks really interesting. I just hope it's not going to be. <laughs> hope it's not going to be another Fifth Element <laughs> with just the 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 completely absurd comedy and everything. So, all right. But anyway, so there's Clive, Clive Owen. Owens in it. Yes, he's great. but he's great, and he really uh, carries. Like I said earlier, he carries the presence in this film. Uh, he should have been awarded an, or at least nominated for an Oscar. I think for this film. Um, cut somebody out of the lineup and, and give him a nomination because he's just great in this film. Truly, truly he is. Uh, I've also, I, I nodded to Claire Hope Ashety's, uh, Ashety as Key. Um, oh, b- before, before you Claire. Have, you have more Clive Owen? Two things that were so interesting that I, 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 I feel like they must somehow tie into a Jesus thing or something <laughs> with with him. But the first one is that there is so much focus on his feet and his footwear throughout this film. You know, we we see him take his uh, shoes off and kick back when he's hanging out with Jasper, uh, trying the strawberry cough. Yeah. And it's focused on his feet. And we see him uh, out of focus in the background as he's petting the cat. Um, we see him struggling to find shoes. You know, they keep getting ruined or he loses them or whatever. And he's walking around in flip-flops for a while. There's so much going on with his feet in this film. I just found that so fascinating and was just trying to figure out what uh, Quaron was saying. And I wondered if that was an element in the book. 
The other thing is the animals. This guy is just the animal man. I mean, he's like an animal whisperer. Every animal everywhere is just wants to be with him. Cats, dogs, um, that kitten, that adorable kitten that starts climbing up his leg. Um, you know, just everything. I mean, he's around animals everywhere. When he when he meets Key, it's a really interesting, um, you know, manger sort of scene where she's just surrounded by cows. We've got that weird scene when he's driving up to go meet his cousin and he passes, he goes through the kind of the park and he looks out the window and he sees somebody with a zebra and somebody with a camel. It's There's so many strange things with animals all kind of connected to him and how he is this magnet for animals. It was almost like a uh, a little bit of a symbolic nod to a. I, I just felt like it was a Jesus sort of thing. I don't yeah, know. I, yeah. I, maybe I'm reading into it, but I don't think so. I think it reads like a pretty thick allegory, and I it's it's fine that way. And actually, for you know, I I think if you're not reading it actively uh, as a, a, a religious tale. Uh, then it comes off as charmingly amusing to see a camel being led through the... the I mean, it's really funny. There's some really funny stuff, um, you know, that, that adds to another dimension to the film. So I think it works. Yeah. Uh, okay, now Claire Hope Ashety. Now Claire Hope Ashety. <sighs> is she adorable or what? She is great. I just love her in this role. Um, she's She does everything so well. She has that uh, sense of uh, fear, loss... Um, hopelessness, hopefulness, confusion. Um, it just, all of that reads so nicely. Yeah. Uh, and and really, uh, I think she is the perfect character to go up uh, sort of against and with uh, Clive Owen's Theo. Like she definitely gives him a run for his money. And then they come as such a pair after the birth scene uh, when she is, I think, so delicately uh, kind of emotionally gives up and gives in to him and allows him to lead her, even though she she doesn't trust him. I mean, it's a it's a really nice arc uh, that is sometimes not played so well. So I thought she was great. Yeah, I'm a virgin. That's so funny. <laughs> it was uh, uh, Julianne Moore as Julian Julian Taylor. I I mean, she's just such a brilliant actress, and she has a very small part. Um, I mean, it's a, but it's a key part. It's a key supporting part. And she has so many layers in this relationship with Theo. And just the scenes that she's playing with him, um, I just, there's, there's just a lot there. You've got the sense of um, romance that they once had, the loss that they share uh, with the loss of their child, the relationship, um, this, this political activism that she has pursued and he has lost all interest in. Um, just all of that as they kind of have their scenes together. I just found it um, just great. I mean, she does that sort of thing so well, and it was just, it was great seeing her in the sort of thing that she handles uh, brilliantly. It was, and I, you know, my notes, I, I wrote her down as predictable, and that often doesn't come off very well, but it's predictably good for her, and you know, in a good way. It's a character that feels so much like an old shoe for her. Uh, I couldn't help but think of, you know, the... Um, uh, was it was the Hannibal um, uh, uh, sequel that she did when she took on the role? Um, uh, right. Starling. Anyhow, but yeah, of, of Clarice. Uh, I you know I felt like it's it's just a really solid kind of uh, all business, um, emotionally distant uh, character for her. Um, I did not find her as compelling in this film as I did in say Boogie Nights, uh, which she just is just excels. Uh, but but she was great, and, and she fit the plot. She did but, what and, she needed to do. And I don't think that this character was meant to be as compelling no, as, no. as uh, her Amber Waves. Right. You know, she this, this is a, uh, it's a small supporting part that really kind of helps us connect to Theo, and obviously the amount of loss that he ends up feeling when she does get uh, killed. Or well, assassinated as we find and out, and it's interesting you say that because I mean I I don't know arguably she has less time than Michael Caine on screen I think but not much, uh, and Michael Caine plays a legendarily awesome character in this film. <laughs> He's so good, right? He is just great. I, I, again, further proof that really Michael Caine should just be in everything. I mean, he's so fun to watch, and um, I you know this kind of this old 
you know, political cartoonist hippie living out in the woods, uh, making his own uh, variations of weed. I mean, it's just hilarious. He just plays it so well. And I think the humanity that we end up connecting with, with, um, for him really comes from the relationship he has with his wife, which is just so heartbreaking and touching, um, the way he constantly is doting on her. And even though she's essentially catatonic, I mean, it's, it's just really touching. And and so check me on this because this is how I I saw the film and I want to make sure I didn't miss a relationship. He is Clive Owen's father-in-law. Is that right? I didn't think so. Oh, see, I thought that that like for some reason I ended up thinking that Julianne Moore was a uh, uh, play or was Julian Taylor was somehow Theo Farron's ex-husband, um, and that ex-wife or ex-wife, whatever. Yes. Don't judge me. Uh, and that they lost a child uh, together right. and that he had, uh, Clive, uh, Theo had a much stronger relationship with Jasper when she, when Julian ran off and joined the, um, the, the cult. And yeah. so he, it, it, so that's why I, I read that as Jasper was Theo's father-in-law and father to Julian. You didn't oh. read that same way? Because no, then they no, see no, that no. picture. He sees that picture of them all together. Uh, and so I thought that they ended up just, you know, as compadres. I thought they were just friends. And I felt like there was a relationship between Theo and Jasper from before all of this began, where he and Jasper had been buddies from something. Mm, okay. I, I'm not exactly sure from where, but that was my sense is that they were just old friends. I don't, I never had a sense that uh, Julian was actually related to Jasper. Okay. All right. Well, I'll take that. It's not as good as I thought it was, but I guess it's, okay. <laughs> uh, I think it's, I think it's interesting that Michael Caine actually based this character on his experiences with his friend, John Lennon. <laughs> so I, I get that right out the gate. <laughs> yeah, of right. course. He said this is the first time he ever portrayed a character who would pass wind or smoke cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> Which weirdly seemed like so right up Michael Caine's alley. It was <laughs> strange. Exactly. Like, first time he fits this role so well. I know. First time I've ever portrayed a character that's so close to my life. <laughs> uh, all right. Chewy. Chewatel IGO4 as Luke. Oh, my God. Goodness, I I have to tell you that now that we've done Serenity and uh, and this, um, you know my uh, my daughter watched this one with me and obviously watched Serenity with me and now she goes around and she looks at me and if I if I do something stupid I drop a spatula on the floor she'll put her hand on my shoulder and she'll say there's no shame in this. <laughs> Just well, hopefully she's scene. also not putting a sword on the floor. Yeah, this no, is a good no, death. This is a good. <laughs> it was a good spatula. <laughs> she did go to uh, Hunger Games camp yeah. after all. <laughs> this is That's a good right. death, Father. There is no shame in this. That's right. Uh, but he is he's a terrific baddie in this film. It's great because he starts he gets to be a pivot character. He's a character that we all really like, and he is just like in Serenity. We know he's bad from early in the film, but we like him anyway. He is duty filled, he's honor bound. In this film, he's duty filled and honor bound, and he's part of the team. And then we get to see him betray everybody, and, and he is still just as good a baddie. He is uh, he's just fantastic. He is great. He is just great. And he, the same year when he did Inside Man, uh, he was working with Clive Owen there too. Yeah. That's too funny. Although I don't think they ever have a scene together in Inside Man. Mm. Well, I like watching these back to back for sure, the Chewy back to backs. Yeah, he's just always great to watch. Another person who really should just be in pretty much everything. He should. And my house, drinking vodka <laughs> tonics with me. Here, here. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for it. Um, then we've got uh, Charlie Hunnam. Which is so funny. I don't Love think that at hairdo, the time, right? Yeah, no kidding. I don't think at the time I knew who he was, and I had seen him in a few a few things, but not. He certainly wasn't the presence that he has become since. And I don't think I even recognized him when I watched this until the cast list popped up, and I was like, Charlie Hunnam was in this. Who was he in this film? <laughs> and I had to look at his character name, and I had to go back, and then finally I saw him. I'm like, oh, the hair throws me every time. That giant, you know. Just all those dreads and that that hair he has, I just never ever put two and two together. So uh-huh. it was so funny to see him popping up here, and it, I, it's great. I mean, he's got a it's not a huge part, but it's uh it certainly is a memorable one. 
it is a memorable one. I, you know, I don't have a whole lot to say about him in this film that you haven't said. What I do have to say is, oh my God, he is remaking Papillon. Uh, and, what? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Michael Noor uh, with uh, Rami Malek uh, from the great, great, great show, Mr. Roboto. Uh, they are doing uh, Papillon, which was obviously a remake of the 1973 film with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. So, wow. I don't even know what to think about that. My world has been shaken. Holy cow. No, that's I know. really interesting. I had no idea that was coming. Yeah, it's coming. So well, that's and something of course, to look forward Of to. course, before that, he's going to be King Arthur. Yeah, right. In the <laughs> bizarro <laughs> King yeah. Arthur world. That'll be a guy. good good back to back with the Great Wall. <laughs> oh, it might actually be more fitting with that uh, Luc Besson film. Yeah, yeah right, right. Uh, okay, Pam Ferris is Miriam. I love this character of Miriam. She is just so, I don't know, she's just the sort of character that um, you end up kind of getting uh, lumped in with when you're on this, in this sort of story, right? And here he is, he's got to um, save this uh, pregnant woman. And Miriam is kind of the the, uh, the sidekick here. And I don't know, she just makes me laugh. She's just such an interesting personality. I think, first of all, I think that the costume design and the hair and makeup and everything with her was done so well because I look at her and I just have such a, a, a sense of who this character is, right? Oh, yeah. And then I see her trying to do that little attempt at Tai Chi. <laughs> and I just... I laugh every time I see that because it's like she's trying to do it and then she keeps kind of falling over and everything and just getting so upset with herself. Oh, it just makes me laugh so much. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I liked her too. She was terrific, but not as terrific for me as Peter Mullen. Ah, uh, yes, Peter Mullen. He is uh he's one of those um those kind of this bit player actors who always pops up in interesting ways and uh his bit here is just uh a lot of fun, and eventually uh, rather deadly. Can you... What do you know? I, this, I'm going to veer off the topic of the movie again into another movie that he is in in post-production. There's another Jungle Book coming out uh-huh. in 2018. Yep. Directed by Andy Circus. Yep. Didn't we just do this? Yeah, we did. We did. It's not a, uh, I believe this one is, well, it's obviously not Disney, but it's a, um, I think more specifically kind of pulled from Rudler, Rudyard uh, Kipling's actual books. Yeah, uh, it's, that's what I gather. I, and not so much from the, obviously the Disney stuff. I just, uh, this was the first I heard of this and it, it blew me a little bit away. Uh, it seems very strange to have this uh, happen. Anyway, it's uh, the it's the whole you know two thing. They yeah. they love battling to get these things out. But don't they need to happen closer together? I mean, this one now feels like I mean, if they're battling, they need to be head to head within six months of each other. Yeah, because this isn't coming out till twenty eighteen. Yes, there are rules. Uh, anyhow, we adore uh, Peter Mullen. He has a storied career. Uh, his um, his role in. Uh, uh, he's been he was in Train Spotting, uh, terrific in Train Spotting, War Horse, uh, Braveheart. Uh, he has been around. He's one of those fantastic faces you can't miss. Uh, and uh, uh, boy, he's been working. He's been working a long time. He's got just a great uh, one of those character great British character actors. Yeah. Did you ever see the the horror film Session Nine? No. It's really interesting. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, he's uh, it, he's kind of the lead in it. It's it's great seeing him leading a story, but it's it's a really uh, kind of this dark. Um, well, I mean, it's a horror film. It's these guys who are are they're cleaning asbestos out of this old abandoned mental hospital. Of course, it, you know, yeah, just, right, right. You know, but uh, David Caruso's in it. Josh Lucas is in it, and um, <laughs> they just start uh, things start going awry as he starts listening to these uh, these tapes of these sessions as he gets closer and closer to listening to session nine, and um, I, I enjoyed it. It was pretty creepy. Nice, uh, creepy little bit. All right, I'll check it out. Yeah. Uh, David Caruso. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything but South Park. Do your impression of David Caruso's career. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, YouTube. Oh, yes. uh, and finally, we've got Danny Houston as Nigel. Yes. Yeah, small part. Good to see Small him. part. Um, but what's great about casting Danny Houston is you're casting somebody who really carries a lot of presence, even if he's in just one scene. Yes, indeed. He is in the scene with the legendary flying pig. I finally have the story on that. Tell me the story. Which I had no idea because I just, uh, you know, there are things that I just don't know, believe it or not. <laughs> Wait, what? But, you know, Wait, stop this. I'm going to cut that part out. <laughs> the people can't know. <laughs> the secret is out. <laughs> oh. So they filmed that scene at Battersea Power Station, which is uh, a uh, place in uh, in London. And the whole idea was that in this future time, this this particular character that uh, that Danny Houston plays, Nigel, who uh, is basically, it's kind of like he's a monuments man sort of guy. He's collecting the great classic pieces of art before everybody destroys them, and he's got some great, uh, you know, great bits here. But he has kind of his base is is this uh, this power station in London. Well, it so happens that this power station also happened to appear on the cover of Pink Floyd's 1977 album, Animals. And on, on the album, we have a, a giant inflatable pink pig floating above the power station. And so Quaron, having known that, included the inf- uh, fl- floating pink pig in the background here to, as kind of a nod to the album. Now, the funny story of the album cover is that this inflatable uh, pig, it was tethered to one of the chimneys, but it actually broke loose from its moorings and uh, drifted right into the flight path of Heathrow. And (laughs) all the helicopters uh, had to track it until it finally landed in Kent. And so it had quite a little, uh, quite a journey, which is... uh, rather funny but yeah so the pig is there uh really for no other reason than as a nod to this pink floyd album which i think is really funny but interestingly just because of the connection to animals that uh, clive owen has it kind of fits with the whole theme which i think ends up being really funny i do too actually and i hadn't made the animal connection i think that's really funny and animals is one of their greater albums pink floyd there you go yeah there you have it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, oh, I guess we do need to make a nod to the, the cameo uh, of P.D. James herself. That's right. She did, pops did, up as Did you as see a, her? I looked, but, uh, you know, there's so many people in that cafe, I just missed it. So P.D. James pops up as a cafe customer. Yes, she does. Okay. Production. What have we not talked about already uh, in terms of getting this thing made? Well, I, I think... Um, Going to back to the long shots and the amazing cinematography by Emmanuel Lubezki. Looking at the six minute, 18 second shot of the building when Theo has to, uh, there's this assault, this, or I should say maybe a siege might be a better term on this building as the, uh, as the, um, uh, the fish, this, this terrorist group is kind of battling the police. And uh, and Theo is trying to get into this building because Luke has taken Key and the baby, and he is trying to rescue them. It took 14 days to prepare to shoot this thing. So that's them rehearsing it over and over, trying to figure out all the camera moves, what's going to go up, uh, what's happening where, where do they need to plant the squibs, um, you know, how is the camera moving, uh, stunts, all that sort of stuff. 14 days to prep it. And then... Once they were ready to shoot it, uh, and then they went back to do another reshoot, it took five hours to get the shot ready again (laughs) before they could shoot it again. (laughs) So I didn't, I was really trying to find how many times they actually had to shoot it, but I I couldn't find that. But just the fact that it took five hours between each take, I mean, that just says exactly the complexity of what they're doing here. Oh, just crazy. Crazy. And I do think it's interesting that we do have the blood getting on the lens when he jumps into the bus after um, after the uh, uh, Luke's guys are trying to kill him. Um, we have blood splatter onto the lens. And Lubeski actually is the one who told Quaron, no, keep it. It's like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. It'll <laughs> enhance the film. <laughs> That's right. Followed by this was your idea, <laughs> but I, I really like it. I like the le- the blood hitting the lens. There is a, I, I know a lot of people feel like it breaks the fourth wall, 
when that happens and it kind of pulls you out because then you watch the film. I mean, you're still in this long shot and you've got another couple minutes where you're just looking at it with some blood on the lens as, as they continue running around. But I don't know, for me, it really carries a sense of that sense of presence that I have. So I, I actually don't mind it at all. In fact, I like it quite a bit. Oh yeah. I, it, it reminds me, I mean, if I was there, I would have blood in my eyes. How about that? (laughs) Yes. Yes, you would. That's what I think about. Yes, you would. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the car that they built? Yes. Crazy car. Uh, crazy car. So so the, the trick here is there is a long sequence, over four-minute sequence, where they're driving. We've got five people in the car. We've got Key. We've got the nursemaid. We've got Theo. Uh, and we've got uh, Julian and, um, and Chewie. Yep. They're all in this car. Five people in a very small car. And the entire sequence is shot from inside the car, and the perspective, you it, it's as if you are sitting in the middle, like on the center console, and you keep looking around as people are talking, and it never stops moving. And the movement is so smooth and so perfect that you think this is has to be somehow composited. Uh, it, it turns out they took a small car and they completely gutted it and put it on top of a much larger base where many crew people can sit in like reclining chairs low to the ground around it and a giant cam- motion control camera on top of the car that is actually pivoting inside the car as these people are talking it was all shot again 100% natural light 100% one take it is a bananas fantastically architected action sequence as Everything starts to fall apart on this road in front of them. A flaming car comes down a hill. Uh, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, looks like wooded militia people come running down to attack the car. They start backing the car up. It is like a giant camera tank with this with the the motion control camera filming everything going outside the the camera from the inside of the car. It's beautiful. And apparently there are a few hidden cuts in there, uh, which they had to kind of do to get from one. Uh, element to the other. The only one that I can really be clear on, and, and I don't know where the cut is, but obviously at the very end of it, they end up outside of the vehicle. That, right, they do. That's true. Um, and or I should say the camera ends up outside of the vehicle as the vehicle drives right, away. Right, right, which is crazy. I didn't actually make a connection that that, was, that had to have been a, a cut because everything else seems so magical. Um, but the other piece is when you watch the, the behind-the-scenes stuff and you watch the, the kind of B-roll as they're shooting this thing and you watch what the actors had to do in the car— to make room right. for the camera, you see them like they're driving. They're the the camera's on them. The camera swings around away from them, and suddenly they are they have to their cameras are on like or their chairs are all on these little the, these rollers to move out of the way and lay down so the camera can shoot uh, can swing over where their head was and shoot behind them. And then as soon as the camera moves, they have to get back up and act like exactly where they were. Uh, you know, running from the crazy goons coming out of the woods. I mean, it's it, it is an amazing piece of not only just tech technology and cinematography but of of performance to be able to contain that shot and maintain the performance is amazing and the blood i mean they've got blood work going on they've got you know that True. element of squibs and uh, you know just uh, it's astounding i mean i, I right she shot right in yeah. the in the neck yeah. i think she shot in the neck yeah uh, fantastic yeah. i mean not that you know that's gross, <laughs> but, you know what do you i know what you mean yeah uh, it was it, it's a it's a an impressive piece of work what this uh, Lubeski and Cuaron did to make this thing happen. Absolutely, I mean, you know, pairing with everyone else, production design, hair, makeup, costumes, all of those people do a great job. The locations, everything, uh, really interesting locations that they find here, from you know Trafalgar Square and Fleet Street, like I already mentioned, to Battersea Power Station, the dockyard mm-hmm. in Chatham. Everything is just such interesting looks, and I love. This reminded me of Gattaca to a certain extent, where they find really interesting existing locations that feel like they have a hint of a futuristic sort of vibe to them and they make it fit within the context and how the dockyard ends up being this kind of base for the fishes, this, this terrorist group. Um, and I love it when he walks out of that interrogation room that they're in and they're in this giant domed thing and he and uh, Julian have that little conversation as they walk. I mean, just such interesting looks to everything that help enhance that futuristic feel. Yeah, we just talked about a very similar thing last week with Serenity, which was the, uh, you know, shooting the... Uh, oh, the high school. 
Miranda at that high school, right? right. right. It was, it's really clever. I think Battle, was it Battle of the Planet of the Apes, where they shot, it was the that civic center that, uh, or the government building that hadn't opened yet, and it just looked like the future's right behind their, the, the uh, studio lot. And so they just took all the cameras out to before the, right after construction finished, but before they'd taken ownership and shot all the outside scenes of the apes uh, in, in this sort of illegally in this building. I think that's a funny story too. So very clever guerrilla work, uh, so to speak, <laughs> uh, in finding these locations. Uh, post-production, we already mentioned, uh, edited with Alfonso Cuaron and Alex Rodriguez. Yep. Uh, and again, just just sharp, the way they put it together. Yeah. The long shots, the the quick cuts, everything. Um, they yeah. They put it together very fluidly. Uh, sound, we mentioned the sound, Richard Beggs as sound designer, Chris Burden, Tim, uh, Tom Johnson, and Mark Patterson as re-recording mixers. Uh, again, the power of the sound, at le- even in just the opening and closing shot, but maintaining consistent sound throughout the uh, uh, these really long sequences, uh, There's that's... That's real craft. And just elements that I really enjoyed, like that kind of um, that ringing in your ear sort of sound when when things would happen. You kind of get that, you know, that 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 tinnitus sort of sound Mm -hmm. of that that noise, just that high pitched post explosion noise um, that uh, really works. And plus the way they blend in this music. I mean, there's not a score to speak of, but but Quaron did have John Tavener write this 15-minute piece called Fragments of a Prayer, and then he kind of scattered bits and pieces of it all throughout. Um, Quaron said that the music uh, resonates with the themes of motherhood, birth, rebirth, and redemption in the eyes of God. Um, and I felt um, like the music works really well. I mean, it's just bits and pieces um, that work, but particularly in some of those key moments, like toward the end, where it really kicks in and just is really powerful and really strong. But otherwise, I think that his use of songs is also really, uh, really great. Um, just they they found some some perfect songs to kind of fit the vibe of everything going on here. The uh, visual effects, again, it's it's deceptively complex. There were effects in this film. Yeah, and these companies, Double Negative, and Frame Store. I mean. Just to speak to how this sort of thing happens, I mean, these people are working with him from the time he's working on the script so that so that they can find the right way to really develop some of these elements. And they work all the way through the shoot, all the way into post and through it, um, trying to uh, just create everything in these environments. I mean, the birth scene is a perfect example. You have these cables coming through the the doorway as, and snaking across over to where Key is lying on this bed. And there is a, um, a uh, prosthetic bottom half for her to kind of slip into. And we see um, him come in with her, get her on the bed. We see the gypsy woman come into the door and he, or, and he kind of has to shoo her out. We follow him and her dog out the door while the camera's doing that. She's slipping into this prosthetic pregnancy birthing thing and then the camera comes back to her so she can deliver this baby, which is just this like little blue doll that they're acting with. And all of that has to be replaced. And it's and they have to paint out all the cables running under the door, um, just everything. I mean, it's just there's so much work trying to put this stuff together. And there's no way they could have done it. Uh, I mean, it's great that they designed these cars and everything in order to shoot these shots, but they had to have a strong visual effects uh, team on board as well to really um, finish it and make it actually fluid. So we love this film. How did it do in awards season? Season. Season. Uh, th- season. This film, uh, it it didn't do too bad. It got a lot of nominations and really... I mean, more than anything, it just ended up on so many people's like top 10 lists. This was one of those movies that was well-loved critically. It did get nominated for three Oscars uh, for Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Achievement in Cinematography, and Best Achievement in Film Editing. It lost to either The Departed or Pan's Labyrinth. Um, uh, Departed for Screenplay and Editing and Pan's Labyrinth for Cinematography. I don't know. Having having uh, discussed The Departed on the show recently, I really feel like this should have taken adapted screenplay. Uh, cinematography. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, cinematography. I'm a little torn with this or Pan's Labyrinth, but I really do like these long shots here. Um, editing. I mean, you know, film is always brilliant and The Departed was uh, very well put together. But again, I'm, I just, I don't know. This is such a strong film. And uh, I certainly lean toward this. And it, it got a slew of other nominations. Um, and awards. Um, so it was 
critically acclaimed, ended up on a lot of top 10 lists. But um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, it didn't, uh, that didn't help it when it came time to the money. Did it, uh, did it do anything in the box office? It didn't do what it should have. <laughs> that's a, that's the thing I was sort of worried about. I mean, award season is is one thing, but but performance uh, in the box office is something completely different for a film like this. And it just doesn't surprise me that it it didn't have the kind of legs that it probably should have. Yeah, it opened Christmas Day, two thousand six, which I think is perfect for a film like this with with yeah. all of the themes it has. Cost seventy six million dollars to make. Um, it ended up uh, making domestically thirty five and a half million internationally about thirty four and a half million uh, so just under uh, so about seventy million is where it landed uh, financials wise that means it lost money at the box office losing an adjusted sixty four thousand per finished minute so uh, it 's shocking that a film that is so good could have uh, just just completely not clicked with uh, crowds but that's what happened yeah it's a it's a funny film because it's expensive it's crazy expensive for a film without any incredibly overt um expensive looking things you know what i mean like it feels so intimate like such a human story throughout the entire thing you don't get a sense that they built any giant sets you don't get a i mean this is not a hundred million dollar film and you know to the eye and yet it it comes perilously close, uh, you know, once you get over that 75 million mark. And and so it's I can see how it feels like a film that, um, you know, that maybe should have been made for less, even though we know that he did some incredibly incredible things to actually, you know, get the story across the way he wanted to do it. Well, and, you know, here's the thing. I mean, I don't know what the prints and advertising ended up uh, costing, how much that affected the budget, but it is possible. I mean, this has gotten so much um, just acclaim since then yeah. and certainly has just a cult following because so many people, I don't even know if it's fair to call it a cult following. It just has a following because people really click with this film that I wouldn't be surprised if um, since it has been released on on, on um home video and everything else if it has found a way to make a little bit of its money back yeah i'd like to believe that at least uh until it makes all its money back i think it's time for us to rank it let's do it head over flickchart.com slash the next reel you know what to do log in with your account and then search for this movie children of men let's see if you like me can raise it from 900 (laughs) let's i love that it jumped so much on your chart that's great (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, first up, we are back to the O Brother block. Children of Men or O Brother, where art thou? I'm going to guess you're going to go Children of Men. 100%. I, too, am Children of Men, Andy. I am so happy. You don't know how happy <laughs> this is making me right now. Have you been sweating? <laughs> I, I really did. I'm like, what if he watches it and he, he just still hates it? I'll never be able to talk to him again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Children of Men or the silent partner. Uh, children of Men for me. Yeah, Children of Men. All right, Children of Men or The Matrix. Another wow. fantastic science fiction film. On my yeah, personal I, list, I think Children of Men is probably higher, though. It's a tough one, though. They're both really solid. Yeah, there's no doubt. It, it's really difficult. I have, uh, uh, you know, I have an allegiance to The Matrix, but I, I don't know that it, it holds up. I'm going to give this to Children of Men. There is no shame in this. <laughs> it's a good rank. <laughs> That's that really needs to be on flick chart as one of the little uh, you know they have those silly quotes <laughs> above every rank that you do. That, they do. That really, That's so true. This is a good rank. There's no shame in this. It's a good rank. <laughs> Children of Men or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Oh come on, man! I am Children of Men. <sighs> And Butch Cassidy's really good. This sucks. <laughs> I'm. I mean, I'm Butch Cassidy. I am. I'm Butch Cassidy. That's okay. There is no shame in this. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right, one, two, two three, three paper. paper. One, one, two, three, three scissors. <sighs> okay, okay, it was fair. <laughs> Children of Men or Jaws? Jaws. Yes, here I say Jaws. 
children of men or inception inception i actually Ooh. had to rank this again in my own thing it actually inception inception that's went out. that's really tough these yeah. are super close i um I, I would really, I feel like these are probably super close on my own flick chart. I'd probably have to look, but I'm just going to say Inception. Um, I, I, okay. I don't know. There is no shame in this. There is no shame in this. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Children of Men or Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark. Gotta go Raiders. Yeah. We are at number 16. Really? Yes. Huh. So it ended up at number 15 on mine. Wow. My personal. Yeah, it went from 904 to 15. Think about that. <laughs> but I told you, it didn't break the top 10. The top 10 is hard to do. It is hard to do. It's really, really tough. So where I, I'm so curious where it is on yours. If you want to know, <laughs> I have to pause. So I, I can log know, out I, and log I, back in. I don't know. It's too, you know, I don't care that much. I. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, no, I see how it is. I yeah, you know, is. whatever. Uh, <laughs> anyway, this was a uh, this was a terrific film, and uh, I'm really glad that you forced it into the list uh, because <laughs> I would not have selected it. I honestly, in our disease list, I would have said, "Ah, eh, it's not a very good disease film." And I'm really glad that that we watched this again because it's it was, you know, insofar as it's kind of a downer. It was delightful. For me, it, it's definitely a, a five-star film. Five stars for me, totally. Uh, it gets me every time the bit where they're walking down the stairs with the baby and everybody just stops. I, oh. mean, I am just, I'm in tears every yeah. time. It's yeah. just so touching. It's so powerful and moving. Where do we go from here? Well, we are, uh, now that we've done our little uh, Chiwetel um, pairing, um, mm-hmm. this is kind of a, a crossover into our Julianne Moore pairing. <laughs> These miniseries. That's right. We're going to be looking at Blindness, which I'm excited to revisit. I haven't seen it. Uh, I've seen it once um, when it first came out on uh, on Blu-ray, and now is a chance to revisit it. But the fact that uh, Fernando Morales uh, directed it, and the fact that it ties in weirdly with the Olympics, which he just had a little part in the opening ceremony. Crazy. <laughs> I got to tell you, I had a really hard time watching the opening ceremony, as beautiful as I think it was. Watching the open ceremony, knowing he did that, and having recently watched City of God, it was no Beijing or London, but uh, I still I still enjoyed it. Enough, no, it was but, beautiful, uh, but there is a lot of complexity in that country, and I think you know seeing him take part in portraying the Olympic side and the City of God side, the favela side, is yeah. uh, it's an interesting bit of sort of I, I'm going to call it uh, dramatic irony, perhaps Econ- economic and social irony. Right, right. Uh, Very anyway. interesting. So, so I too look forward to watching Blindness. Uh, I actually haven't seen it, um, so I'm really excited about it. I know you've said interesting things about it. So, <laughs> there we go. I got, and uh, you know, I gotta go to bed. Okay, but first, pull my finger. Amazon giveth, Andy. Oh, as Amazon always do. Oh, man. <laughs> Bottom of the barrel, one stars. I'm going to go first because yours is so long. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I've got a one star from uh, Nancy. This was March, 20, March 10th, 2015. She says, this is a terrific book that morphs into a dreadful movie. Now, I have to say, I can't judge this because I haven't read the book. It's quite possible she's right, and you and I might have to go re-rank the entire thing after we read the book. Although I will say, P.D. James was very happy with the uh, interpretation here. So you're building a case. I like how you're doing this. That's good. Mm. She's, Nancy says, P.D. James wrote an engrossing novel that could have and should have become a stellar film. Unfortunately, the highly overrated director distorted the story beyond recognition. The result is a gratuitously violent, politically confused, logically incoherent, and dumbed-down boring mess of a movie. And that is Nancy. Wow. Yeah. Well, Angela 
also gave it a one star very recently, actually, just this past July. And she says, don't rent or don't rain. <laughs> that's, that's my voice for Angela. I that's have in it. my head. This is Angela's review. Didn't do nothing for me. <laughs> You're Didn't do nothing for me. <laughs> You're a there regular you Alan Tudyk. <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. <laughs> it is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In season six, our disease films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit. Some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? <laughs> Our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? Only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> we talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make the Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. Hey! 